Just so you all know, today, while we're going to be talking about a lot, we're predominantly going to be focusing on dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, and ADHD. There are many more neurodivergent conditions around. I mentioned about our team. We've been going since about 2015, and it's a nice bunch. We're based roundish London. We work remote now. We work predominantly across the UK, but a little bit international here and there. Here's a picture of me, if in case you're wondering, does this guy even know what he's on about? Sometimes I look more professional, and when I do, sometimes you can see me doing my masters or talking about neurodiversity on TV. But like I said, fingers crossed, you're in good hands. I spend nearly every day of my life talking about this subject. Do feel free to grill me on any areas that you want. I'm also ND. I have dyslexia, dyspraxia, and autism. So hopefully this comes from a less of a condescending place and more uh, about my personal experience as well as a professional side. But what I'm more interested to know is what do you actually want to learn about today? So what area of neurodiversity are you curious to learn more about and why? And genuinely, if you even don't even know what neurodiversity is, feel free to put that down. If you have a particular question around children at home, maybe yourself, maybe people you're managing, any area whatsoever, we can have a little look at that today. All right, ADHD, someone in my team is diagnosed. Brilliant. We're definitely talking about ADHD. How to better support people across the team who are ND and how to support their productivity for themselves and the business. Yep. ADHD and how to best approach a conversation with someone who has ADHD. How important is a diagnosis? Okay, nice. So I'm seeing the theme of ADHD. We will, I'll put more emphasis on that. Quickly, let's answer this one. How important is a diagnosis? I think that really depends on the circumstances. Before you were 18, I would say it's pretty important because it means you can have access to support in university and college and other areas. But as an adult, I would argue that the benefit is less pronounced. For instance, the support you get in the workplace is the exactly same whether or not you're diagnosed or not diagnosed because you still be covered under the Equality Act. However, if you're someone who had, due to the way that society has treated you over the years, taken a bit of a knock on your self-esteem, which is very common, having a diagnosis can be quite liberating and can help make all the pieces in your past kind of make sense a little bit more. So it depends. I would say arguably more important for those in education just because the system is less flexible. Adapting training to accommodate neurodiversity. Fingers crossed. Today is also an example of best practice. So how I'm delivering today with a bit more of an interactive side is a good way of starting. Autism, how to assist with supporting those affected. I would be a little bit mindful on the word affected. Obviously, I know what you mean by that. Because autism and ADHD aren't something which you get like a rash. It is something which is who you are. It's part of your DNA. You can't separate it. That's why it is completely different from mental health. There is overlap. Support and language disorders, someone in my team is diagnosed. Do you know what? While I'm not going to be predominantly focusing on speech and language disorder in itself, obviously dyslexia and dyspraxia and dyscalculia, which we will touch upon, do come under that. Okay, let's start, look at some questions. Ways to turn the conversation from I can't do that to to do that I need. Yes, that is a really good one as well. Neurodivergence doesn't make anything impossible. It just make thing, It just can make things more challenging. Reasonable adjustments are adjustments which can allow you to navigate those challenges and focus on what your strengths are. You have to understand the context. Being neurodivergent is tough. You've probably spent your whole life being put down consistently. So this kind of I can't attitude, while I can see why that isn't the attitude we want to go forward, You've got to understand why people might feel that way. All right. The access to work process and how we can best support neurodiverse colleagues. Yes. At the end of this presentation, I'll talk a little bit about access to work, which is a government grant, which can get additional funding for people in your team. Okay. Doing good so far. ADHD adults. What strategies are useful in dealing? I'm not sure. Oh, are, are useful. <laughs> Dora, I'm not mocking. I'm heavily dyslexic. I can't read as well. I can read. I just really struggle. Okay, nice. Yep, we're doing that as well. Oh, what tools can Paxton use to offer an assist neurodiverse in the workplace? Are their tools more specific or more broadly helpful? You know what? It really is a case by case. I wouldn't recommend like a blanket. These are things that help because it depends on the role of the individual. As 
I'm guessing a lot of you work behind a desk. There are some good stuff that can be supportive. Okay. All right. Let's move on to your personal experience. This can either be either you personally are neurodiverse or someone you know is, or just whatever one you have the most exposure to. And I'm going to give a real quick in a nutshell definition of what all of these are, just so we are all on the same page. Let's kick it off. So dyslexia is the most common of all of the NDs, and that is mostly around reading. It can also affect concentration. It can affect retention and it can affect memory. Dyslexia is like when the brain doesn't have the information, sees the information and interprets it alternatively. Dyspraxia used to be known as the clumsy child syndrome. One, that's a bit offensive. And two, it doesn't just affect children. It is a motor coordination condition and it can affect how you move, how you talk, how you can interact with the world around you. Think of dyspraxia like having the information in your head. In order to get uh, information that you already have out, there's a bit of a traffic jam. So things can take a little bit longer to come out. It's why in meetings, you may not always be quite quick at coming up with answers. It doesn't mean you don't know the answers. Autism is a big one. Autism is around how we socialize, how we interact with people, our sensitivities to the world around us. Autism, you need to have something called the triad of impairments, and it's having challenges in repetitive behavior, social communication, and also nonverbal communication. Autism has like quite a few names. You've got autism, you've got ASD, autism spectrum disorder, ASC, autism spectrum condition. There's, there's a few of them here, and we are going to be breaking them down. Now, ADHD, which is what I'm understanding, it, it will put the most focus on, is attention deficit hyperactive disorder. Now, ADHD sounds like there's a lot going on in there, and there is, but it's not really one diagnosis. It's another umbrella term. The reason we put that H in brackets is that a lot of people think to have ADHD, you need to be hyperactive. Not true. A lot of individuals do not demonstrate the hyperactive side. ADHD comes in three flavors. You've got, sounds like ice cream. It really isn't. ADHD can be inattentive, so it can struggle with concentration. It can be hyperactive, which means you can like more fidgety. It can be combined, where you have a combination of both. Most people are combined. A lot of individuals are also just inattentive, which used to be called ADD. Then they just combine them all. You get ADHD regardless. And it, that's really useful to know because what you think it isn't what it actually is. And as a result, people may not be getting the right support. So all of these at the top, I would say, are our bare necessities of neurodivergence. These are the ones that come to mind when we first think of neurological differences or developmental conditions. There are others that are less well known for a number of reasons, mostly due to the way we diagnose people. And normally being neuro neurodivergencies are like top trumps where certain ones have more weight. And that is just because of how we distribute support in the UK. So let's say dyslexia is considered more recognized than dyscalculia. Autism and ADHD is considered uh, more needing of support with say dyspraxia. So there, unfortunately, it shouldn't be that way. There is a little bit of a hierarchy. Now, dyscalculia is like the flexor of the maths world, as always, is not to do simply with not being able to do maths. It could be that you are great at maths, you struggle to show your workings out, or you are really good at showing your workings out for some reason that you still get, there's still mistakes in the end process. It's when little things can be misinterpreted. The key thing here is None of these are due to lack of intelligence. They are due to how we process the intelligence that we already possess. Then you've got dysgraphia. Dysgraphia, apparently Agatha Christie had dysgraphia. It is more to do with writing rather than reading. You can have dysgraphia and not have dyslexia and vice versa. Dysgraphia can affect your handwriting. You might be really intelligent. When it's your chance to write on the board or to make notes, they are pretty much non-legible. It can also affect how you hold things. So where someone who doesn't might hold quite conventionally, someone with dysgraphia might hold a little bit awkward uh, just because of the way that their brain has created those neuro pathways in our brain. All of these ones that I've mentioned, super straightforward, easy neurodivergent because they are all neurodevelopmental, meaning that they all 
formed in the womb or very early on in life. They are all conditions which I would argue aren't inherently a disability, more so disabling by society. Now, if you're wondering why I'm saying more or less, because term neurodiversity is a concept. It isn't something you can hold and grasp. It's not something you can easily define. So there isn't actually a comprehensive list of everything that counts as neurodivergent. This is why we've got Tourette's on here and OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. While are they or aren't they not, it depends on the perspective. Because for some individuals, it's just a different way of thinking and to them, they do not consider it a disability. Others, it can be very disabling and can hinder them from day to day life. So it's more depending on the individual or their place in life or the different environment. Then the next stage is mental health illnesses. They are different because mental health illnesses are things that you can develop. They are things that can be cured and they are things which more or less are always a disability for the most part. However, being neurodivergent, you are more likely to have a mental health challenge because you are swimming upstream all day long. It is tiring and it takes a toll on you. Just know that a likelihood is higher. It's not inherently part of it. Now, everything I just told you isn't really that useful. Oh, why? <laughs> because we aren't doctors, or at least I'm not. Maybe some of you are. We aren't diagnostic professionals and labels are created for doctors in order to have a starting point in order to support people. It does not give us all the information we need to support people. Quite often, people have what we call comorbidity or co-occurring conditions. This is if you have one thing, you very likely have another thing. Think of how we diagnose people as, okay, you've got these many characteristics and traits, enough so that we can group them and give it a label, or you have this many characteristics and traits, enough that we can group them and label them. That label is just a starting point. For instance, you could have autism and have anxiety and that anxiety is mental health and that might be the more debilitating factor. You could also have dyslexia and depression because continuously making mistakes that people are always pointing out can really get you down. Sensory sensitivities, those on the autism spectrum can often find lights too bright, sounds too noisy, smells too irritating. These things and be more debilitating than the condition itself. This is an interesting one because a lot of the time we think these are all learning disabilities. Learning disabilities just means you may find it more challenging to learn in a conventional way. So in most cases, yeah, they are learning disabilities. They aren't intellectual disabilities. You've got to know the difference. Intellectual disabilities is you have a lower intelligence than the average population. Learning disabilities is just harder to learn. Einstein, who, let's face it, was probably one of the smartest people ever, he had a learning disability. He didn't have an intellectual disability. The people you're going to meet in a workplace are probably not going to have an intellectual disability. Do not think they are one of the same. They definitely are not. Impulse control. Those with ADHD can often struggle with impulse control. Essentially, our brain loves this chemical called dopamine. And it's always trying to find the quickest route to get that dopamine. That can mean that our body struggles to contain itself. It also means that those with ADHD are a higher likelihood of, say, addiction or gambling conditions. I'm not saying you definitely have one. I'm just saying you're more likely to. So probably best not to start. It'll be difficult to stop. <laughs> and, oh, well, no, come back. Then we've got mood disorders. Again, associated, not inherently part of it. Sleep disorders, very common in those with ADHD as well. The brain can really struggle to switch off, which means some days you may be more tired than others. And Tourette's. So I'm not saying that those who have dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism and ADHD are definitely going to have these. I'm just saying they're more likely to and the chances are that you will know about it is a lot higher. People only normally say about the one thing. So keep that in mind. Now, quiz time, because everybody loves a good quiz. How many people do you think are neurodivergent worldwide? So what is the prevalence? Are we looking at about 1 in 7, 1 in 17, 1 in 70? How likely is having a neurological dip variation compared to the majority of the population? Woo! It is 1 in 7. So officially, we're looking at about 1 in 7 to 1 in 15, depending on where you get your stats from. It's 
incredibly prevalent, like really common. Just so we understand what we mean by neurodivergent, neurodivergent umbrella term, that is like the overarching thing. Neurodiverse just means people think differently. So everyone is neurodiverse. If you think substantially different from the majority of the population, that is when you'd probably be neurodivergent. If you do not have neurodiver, if you aren't neurodivergent, that's when we might say neurotypical. So though these words all sound similar, they do have different meanings. Ooh, question. Oh, okay. I'll take it. You were right. Okay. Two or four. Let's see how we get on this one. What percentage of UK HR feel confident in supporting ND employees? So this was done from a white, a, a national report by the CIPD in 2018. And we were asking HR managers, not which ones don't want to help, which ones don't feel confident. Ah, it was 10%. Uh, I'm guessing those in HR picked the, the lesser. <laughs> Honestly, this doesn't mean that HR aren't a do not want to support. It's that they may lack the knowledge in order what to do if someone was to come up to them and say, hey, I have ADHD. And this is a big problem all over. We have a lot of people who are neurodivergent. Organizations want people to disclose because it makes everyone's life easier. Why would we disclose if we, the support isn't already there to support us? So we do have a bit of a cultural shift needed in order to get people to feel more psychologically safe to open up around this. All right, three or four. Which age group discloses neurodivergent most? What age is most likely to go up to the manager? Hey, this is how my brain works. This is what works best for me. Here's my preferences. Are younger people more likely to? Or maybe are older people more likely to? Okay, the tension is strong on this one. Seven, six, five. Four, three, two, one, and the answer. Ooh. Okay, anyone want to have a, has a guess um, why younger people are more likely to? And I tell you, there's more to this answer than you might initially think. Or maybe a better question shouldn't be why younger people are more likely to or why older people are less likely to. We know there is more stigma in the work. Um, we know there is more awareness than ever before around neurological differences. People in college and university get support for being neurodivergent. You're more likely to get diagnosed. Here's where the kind of misconception comes. You th people think it's a condition that you can grow out of. Absolutely not. It's something which is with you for your entire life because this isn't a something which you catch or you grows. It is you. It's again, it's your DNA. You can't really separate it. You, you can't separate it. Older people are less likely to talk about it because they probably don't know they're neurodivergent or they have seen so much discrimination and so much stigma and all the negatives attached to it for so long. So do keep in mind, while of people in your population may talk about it less, it doesn't mean that they might not also need support. Other factors to look out for is that males are more likely to be diagnosed than females because of how they show their characteristics. I'll put it in a nice way. And people from minority backgrounds, uh, like BAME backgrounds, are also much less likely to have official diagnosis. So this is one of the key reasons why I don't like putting too much emphasis on diagnosis, because if we do that, then a lot of people do not get the support that they could really benefit from. Let's do the very last question and then fun will be over. All right. How can managers support ND talent? Effectively. So what is the best thing we can do in order to support people? What about creating a safe place for disclosure? Maybe a place where we can talk about it openly and not have a kind of, yes, openly. What about a little bit of universal design? Could this be helpful? This is when we create things with neurodivergent people in mind to begin with, rather than retrospectively and thinking, oh, we should probably do this different now. Knowing people in our team, because everyone's an individual and labels are just labels. And lastly, advocacy supporting workshops. Yeah, it's nice. They're all correct. I did this because I wanted every one of you to feel like a winner today, just in case you got all the other questions wrong. It's always nice to have one of these questions. Honestly, there isn't a right way to support people. It's very individual. All of these would be a really great starting point. So let's see how we all did. Oh, very interesting. Marcelo. Wow. Congratulations. Absolute winner. Nick, a solid second, and Sam, a respectable third. Well done, everyone. A raise for all of you.
I, I'm not actually allowed to do that. You did good. Now, what did we learn? We learned that quizzes are fun. We also learned that neurodivergence is incredibly common. It's literally just how human beings think. It's a natural part of being human. But we also know that managers have a long way to go to improve their understanding. And this might affect the amount of people who voluntarily disclose, even though the sooner people do disclose, the sooner support strategies and processes can be done to begin with. What normally happens is people only talk about it when trouble has already happened. It's much better to talk about it at the beginning. The right practices and support can be given. We also know that it is lifelong. This isn't something that this is just going to blow over. It can affect you differently depending on stress, other factors in your life. It is lifelong. The simple solutions often give the biggest ch changes. So we aren't looking at you reinventing the wheel. We're talking about really simple things that can make a massive difference. Okay, we're done with that. We're going to move on to something called the spiky profile. And this is a good way of describing what neurodivergence actually is. So on here, I want you to rank your skills. How good are you at relationships? Are you really creative? Are you more of a mathematical person? And just rank yourself. The reason I want to do this is that most people, while we all have our ups and our downs, are more, they're more average in terms of their ups and their lows. I would say more of a generalist. So of course, there's going to be some things you're better at than others. Those skills don't vary dramatically. Whereas someone who is neurodivergent, there tends to be a real big fluctuation in your abilities. You might find, say, reading incredibly challenging. You might be really creative or vice versa. If you were just terrible at everything, you are not neurodivergent. Neurodivergence has to have that variating ability. So this shows that being neurodiverse isn't about intelligence. It's about the distribution of, what, of your intelligence. So it's not a lack, it's just a different distribution. Now, as a team, you can see that we naturally quite well round ourselves and we want to have that co cognitive diversity in a team. If everyone in the team thought the same, we would be in a bit of a stalemate in terms of keeping things fresh and coming up with new ideas. All right, let's do a little bit more of a deeper dive on each individual condition because I think it's good to know. Now, dyslexia, we talked about how it predominantly focuses on reading and writing. What does dyslexia actually look like? It's different for everyone. And for one individual, Maggie Adrin Pocock, who's a British space scientist, awesome individual, look them up if you haven't heard of them. They were very into science. Let's face it, I do science. It's ridiculously academic and honestly isn't that accessible to those with dyslexia. So you think you might just want to give up and quit. Not Maggie. Maggie decided that they're going to do a more hands-on practical side of science and do engineering. And as a result, they absolutely flourished and they became world-renowned for their public speaking skills and to bring a subject to life, which a lot of individuals struggle to make accessible and interesting to others. So this is just one example of how a disability can actually be a USP, a unique selling point, assuming that there is flexibility. All right, on this screen, I want you all to give it a read. If you can read it, thumbs up. If you can't read it, thumbs down. Okay, give it all a go. Why don't you said you could read it straight away? Give it a chance. Okay, there's a lot of text moving around here. Okay, brilliant. Okay, I'll put you out your misery if you're still trying. Now, if a lot of you can read it and be like, nice, it's not meant to be Mission Impossible. This is meant to be readable. It will take you a little bit longer to read than others. Why? Because your brain doesn't have the algorithm. It doesn't have the code in order to solve the uh, written problem. Writing is a code, and some of us who are able to read easily can work, we can break words apart, but with dyslexia, maybe it's like a flat image where you either know the word or you do not. So if you've seen the language before, super easy, barely an inconvenience. If you've never seen it, difficulty. Look, she can read, it takes a lot of concentration. She seems to jump, let seems to jump around. I remember reading about no idea and it's nearly impossible to figure this out because the brain is just not able to retrieve the way of decoding. This is why sometimes dyslexia can be a real stopper and other times not even going to be noticeable. It really depending on the context and the support around you. All right, how can we support someone with dyslexia? 
a couple of tech tools, gadgets and gizmos, text to speech to text, things like that can be really useful. I will say, however, while I do use that software, when you're working in an open planned office, it can be really awkward to use because people are listening into you. And you know how there's such a thing as like a backseat driver. There are such things as a backseat emailer. Like when I'm doing my emails and my voice, people are like, you might want to include this or how about this? So having a correct space can be really useful. Diagrams and charts are more digestible in terms of how a lot of individuals are able to process information. It's a bit like when we're reading, if you have writing compared to an image, an image, you'll always be able to draw the information from quicker. Extra time for tasks just to mitigate against the additional processing that your brain has to undertake. Make things a little bit more step by step, a little bit more like recipe book style. Moving nicely on, we've got dyspraxia. Now, I don't think any of you selected that you knew dyspraxia. Dyspraxia is actually as common as dyslexia not as well talked about. We talked about while it does affect motor coordination, things like riding bike, tying your shoelaces, doing up buttons, because the information in your head is getting gridlocked, it can also affect communication and memory retention and retrieval. So let's say you're all in a meeting and someone comes over to you and they said, all right, what's the answer to this? Where everyone else is able to be really witty and just come off the beat, you might take a little bit while for the information to sink into place. This is why people with dyspraxia can often get quite demotivated or feel like they lack intelligence. Again, not the case whatsoever. People do end up feeling that way. Cara Devravine, the English model, she has dyspraxia. While it's more inherently difficult to do things that require, require a lot of communicate, a lot of movement, she does it anyway. She's a fantastic communicator. She can play the guitar. She can play the drums. And you wonder why. This is the key thing here. Just because someone inherently struggles with something, it doesn't mean that they absolutely do not want to do it. A lot of us love a good challenge. Do not take tasks away from people without having that discussion beforehand. Now, for dyspraxia, I see it as solving a Rubik's Cube. Imagine every time someone asks you a question, you have to solve a puzzle before you're able to answer it. Of course, it's possible. Sometimes you can solve it faster than other times. Ultimately, it's going to put you at a bit of a delay. Dyspraxia can also be quite inconsistent in terms of, let's say you ask me a question. No, what are you working on today? I can answer it straight away. You're not even going to notice anything. Maybe because I'm calm, I'm relaxed, there's less other things on my plate. Yet other times you may ask me, no, what are you doing today? And I might be delayed. Other times I might have short attention. It can affect you differently, even though it doesn't go away. My top tips for dyspraxia, and again, keep the questions coming in if you do have any, is to break tasks down in smaller steps. The way our brain works is that the more tasks we add to it, the more likely it's going to get overloaded and the more likely it's just going to be like, nah, I'm going to sit this one out. Smaller tasks really help. Gain diagrams help, additional times lots of breaks. And another thing which, because it does affect movement, believe it or not, you can even get bad backs and like poor wrist movements with dyspraxia. So having like ergonomic keyboards, like additional support for like posture really can make a difference in the long term. Okay, smashing through it, deep dive into autism now. We talked about how autism can affect people differently. Autism really isn't a singular thing. It is a spectrum. What that means is every single person is different. This is even on a genetic level. If any of you had heard of the term Asperger's, that used to be a term for a type of autism. Teen got the chop. Why? Because it wasn't really that useful. It was simplifying autism too much. Say you have a classic autism or you had Asperger's. Woo! If you were in the middle, they scrapped it. That being said, if anyone in your team does resonate with having Asperger's, that's probably because they were diagnosed pre-2013. Good rule of thumb, if you're talking about autism genuine, more genuinely, ge generally, use autism or say ASD or ASC. If you are talking to an individual who has described himself as Asperger's, then use that. An example is Greta Thunberg, who resonates with Asperger's. Also, Elon Musk, not that they're similar. Greta is incredibly focused and driven on areas that she personally has an interest in. Those with autism normally can be really focused. 
think of it about not having less intent, less attention or more attention than the rest of us. Their attention is more directed. That can be really amazing if the thing they're working on is within that direction. But if it falls on the other side, it's very difficult to fake interest. It's a bit like if you have a conversation with me, if I'm interested, I'll be the best chatter ever. If I'm not interested, I really struggle to remain interested. Talk to me about football. I'm going to, they'll be like the lights are on, no one's home. And it's not me being rude. It's just my brain isn't able to fix on things which don't engage it. A good way of describing autism is a little bit like operating systems on a computer. So what I want you to do is tell me which operating system is your OS of choice. Are you more of a window people or are you more of an Apple person? Now you may already guess where I'm going with this. So I'm going to say it. I say both computers are exactly as good as each other or more or less, right? But why do more people use Windows? It's because more software and more games actually work on it. Is that because Apple computers aren't able to run those games or those programs? No, of course they can run them. But we haven't coded for that platform. We haven't created things with Apple in mind. That is very much like what it's like being aut having autism. Autism is like being an Apple computer and being neurotypical is like a Windows computer. In theory, you have the exact same potential as all your peers. Life is more difficult for you because everything you have to do, you have to recode, reprogram. You have to put additional effort into just stay afloat rather than being able to thrive. Often think about how lucky you are that the world you live in was very much created with your mindset at the forefront. And those of autism, we often have to spend so much energy just doing things which you might find completely second nature. All right, for supporting your colleagues with autism or ASD, clear instructions, simple language. Eventually, when you're talking, if a word has slightly different meanings, our minds can get a little bit distracted. So this is a real basic example. Let's say it's raining cats and dogs. You may know it's just a way of describing heavy rain. Someone with autism probably knows that. They're probably going to be thinking about that's just yeah. ridiculous. That isn't making any sense. And that brain kind of gets side distracted. If you want communication to be as effective as possible, say what you mean. Easier said than done. I'm always using analogies. Do not be surprised if people walk away with a different meaning. Another way of looking at this is emojis. They mean different things, different people. Uh, so sometimes your words, while you might be saying something to someone and you're like, I have no idea why they haven't understood this, that doesn't always translate to their understanding or what they took away from it. Routine structure can be really beneficial in a world which is excessively noisy. Uh, having a clear roadmap can allow you to feel more calmer and at ease. Minimize noise and light. I'm not saying work in darkness. Just be careful of extremes. Things that might slightly irritate you might really ir irritate someone who, with ASD. Most important, do not make any changes without speaking to the person. We truly are all individuals. Have that open dialogue. Find out what works right. All right, we're on to the big one. ADHD. ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder, I said used to be ADD or ADHD, but it's just ADHD. It can affect people very different. Think of ADHD as not so much about a lack of attention, more than more like an abundance of attention. So where your brain will only focus on one thing, some of ADHD will focus on everything. Now, normally people are able to quite easily tune out information which is necessary, like someone working beside me or additional music playing. They're able to focus on the thing they need to. Those with ADHD, their brain is going to do a bit of a scatter approach and try to get as much information as possible. So you can see how in certain instances, that can be really challenging if your task is to focus. Best approach is not to micromanage someone with ADHD, to give them a list of priorities and say, you know what? I don't care how you do this. This needs to be done today. This is the number one. I always think understanding a little bit of the neuroscience can really help you understand why this is the thing. We talked a bit about dopamine. In our brain, we've got lots of nerves. Our nerves, they are called neurons. Those neurons have chemicals in them. Those chemicals are called neurotransmitters. And our brain is sending them back and forth. People with ADHD, their body can struggle to absorb those chemicals 
or give those chemicals or recycle those chemicals. And that can mean a lack of dopamine. Dopamine is essentially translates to attention slash reward. So when we have loads of tasks to do, our brain is already at a deficit of dopamine. It's automatically going to be trying to get the low hanging fruit because the low hanging fruit is the quickest way to get a dopamine boost. So if you leave the brain to its own free will, it's always going to gravitate towards those low hanging fruit. And ADHD, another way of looking at it is it's not that you have more energy, which some people think it's again due to the distribution. So where you might be able to use up your energy a little bit, little all the way to the end of the day, some with ADHD might go use all their energy up in like the first half and be on a massive lull for the rest of the day. And this is why some people with ADHD can often struggle with the nine to five, can struggle with sleep because they're not able to regulate how much energy they're able to give to each separate tasks. A good example of someone with ADHD is Simone Biles, Biles, who is the most decorated American gym lass of all time. They have ADHD, it's never held them back. It has given them a very unique drive and hyper focus. Now, of course, that's an amazing thing. Now, surely if Simone has it and she's doing amazing, wouldn't we all want it? People realize that these strengths are very real. They do not come for free. There's always a bit of a trade-off. So while you might be hyper-focused, it does mean afterwards you'll be incredibly drained and you will have to recoup that kind of lost energy reserves. Organizations typically require people to be a certain level of productive consistently. They don't really allow for bits of like lulls and dips and peaks. And that's exactly what happened to Simone where in Olympic, they just wanted more and more from her. And she very publicly suffered from mental health challenges. So as I said, from the very beginning, having ADHD doesn't mean that you definitely are going to have mental health challenges. It does mean you're at higher risk of it. And it isn't the ADHD, which is typically the disabling factor. It is the kind of the strain that comes along with it from people's expectations and opinions about you. Now, when it comes to supporting ADHD, Always, it's not a one size fits all. A few tips I think work quite well is allowed for more varied hours. We've got someone in our team who they, because they're ADHD, their brain really struggles to switch off at night. They work really late and they struggle to wake up in the morning. Rather than just saying tough luck, wake up earlier, we compromise. They come into work later. They also work later. This isn't pick what you choose. This is accepting that we understand how their brain works. We end up getting a more productive time out of them by being more flexible. Having kind of deadlines and tasks, like I said, it's not about micromanaging. It's about setting like a hierarchy of what needs to be done versus what can be done are so underrated. Our brain needs rebooting. It needs a, fr a refresh. I, when we can get gridlocked on something, a break, even five minutes can be more than enough in order to allow us to start again completely fresh. Simple instructions, the more we overcomplicate it, the more we're going to be hitting brick walls and the more likely our brain might get fixed on the wrong thing. I've had conversations with people where I talk quite extensively about a subject and they have focused on one thing and completely ignored everything I said right after that. So what I do is I only talk about the most essential information first and allow people to ask follow-up questions should what? they have any. Oh, mystery question. Why allow remote work? Why allow remote work or varied hours? That is mainly due to acknowledging that our brains work differently. Those who are neurotypical, their brains find it easier to balance their energy reserves throughout a 24 hour period, where those with ADHD will often struggle. For instance, they'll might put 110% into the first few hours, and then there'll be no juice left in the battery after that. So it's just appreciating like how our brains naturally work. It's not that the person is going to be doing less work overall. Their hours of productivity can also vary quite dramatically. There is also an argument that working from home, because you're in a more natural environment, you, it's taking them less information. Your brain has less things to focus on. Now, that being said, I'm not saying that all of you should like 100% work from home. What I am saying is take it case by case. Having blanket policies normally don't allow for the nuances of each individual brain. 
All right, we're doing well, everyone. We're almost there. Strengths. We talk so much about negatives all the time about this, that. I think while the challenges are absolutely real, we should also acknowledge the strengths and benefits of supporting our colleagues can bring to the team. So yeah, any strengths that you know to be associated with being neurodivergent. And I like to do this because sometimes people like to see us as a pity party or disabled. I don't think that's the case. I think if the right adjustments are in place, then the strengths that can come out of us are absolutely valuable to organizations. Those strengths do not come for free. Nice, different outlook, creativity, hyper-focus, attention to detail, bigger picture seers. All of these are absolutely great. Obviously, they're going to be different for everyone. Detailed, nice. We need to support people. You aren't going to get these skill sets hitting the ground running. You do have to have a really solid foundation to build upon, giving people these adjustments. All right. We talked about what we can get if we support people. How do we actually support them? This is where access to work comes in. Now, all access to work is, it's a name of a government scheme for workplace needs assessments. If any of you have ever had a workplace needs assessment, typically you'll have them for a special chair for your bag, something for your wrists. They will often happen for those who have hidden disabilities or neurological differences. They absolutely count. Often, people only get this support once they're already struggling, when really it should happen way before. So if you've not heard of this scheme, essentially it means you can pretty much get most of the support paid for you. If your organization has less than 50 employees, it's always free. If someone has started within six weeks um, of joining your company, always free. If someone only needs coaching or mentoring and not equipment, always free. If you don't apply to those brackets, it's heavily discounted. All you need to be eligible is to have a job. As long as you're full employed over 16 hours, you're good to go. Then you have an assessment. Honestly, this is like a really friendly chat. Super easy. Not scary at all. Then an organization like us, we will apply on your behalf. It should be known that you can go directly by the government. The difference of coming via an organization like Exceptional Individuals is that we specialize. We only support people who are neurodiverse. So we hopefully know more on that area. And then we do the training and we make sure that all the support is given. It is really important that the training is delivered. What I find time and time again, organizations will give you a big bag of expensive goodies and you're not trained effectively on it. And that is the key reason why people say, uh, it wasn't that useful. It is useful. You do have to have the right strategies in place. Oh, any questions on access to work? I'm happy to answer. Do all companies offer this? Does Paxton? Yes, and this is a UK-wide initiative. Essentially, you can apply for it yourself. You don't have to go, you have to tell your company at the start. I would recommend doing that. And the reason why is that it's not completely confidential. So someone in your team, like the HR or line manager, will have to approve it. So when they're doing the assessments, you have a say in this. You get to review the assessment before to make sure you're happy with it. If you're happy with it, then it will be sent on to your representative and then they will have to approve it. So absolutely, you are, everyone's able to do this. The only kind of criteria if you're not allowed to do it is I think if you're a civil servant because they have their own separate scheme. Okay, everyone, how long does the process take? That is a really good question. The assessment literally takes an hour, nice and simple. From doing the assessment to getting your support can take three months plus even more. And that's a long time. So this is a really great process for people who do not need the help ASAP. If you need the help right now, this isn't a great process. If that's the case, I would recommend going private and that's where you pay for the report and equipment. So normally what I recommend to organizations is have a bit of budget for those who need the help right away. For those who do not need the help, should the organization be seeking to support people with reasonable adjustments if the person is undiagnosed? Absolutely. Because like I said, if we're only supporting people who are officially diagnosed, we're basically only supporting white men. You can see why that's problematic. The vast majority of people who are neurodiverse are undiagnosed for systemic reasons, such as economic background, gender, race, a whole heap of things. So we would be doing a massive injustice to people and also wouldn't really be covered under the Equality Act if we only picked those who can prove they need help. 
What if we are having issues with someone are still waiting for their support? Sometimes it's not reasonable to wait. I totally see where you're coming from, right? Getting support takes a while. And when someone gets support, the best practice is to wait three months for the support to be implemented before you can make any decisions on their work ethics or how they're doing in the workplace. That's a long time. Now, important to know that You are duty bound as an employer to make reasonable adjustments. Access to work is just a process to support organizations who can't afford some of the more expensive adjustments. So I would say it would be up to the company then to pay for additional support. It is possible to get it reimbursed later on if the grant is taking a while. Just know it's not 100% guaranteed. All right, nice. Now, if you do have any questions, you are always welcome to message me. I'm always happy to reach out. We have a YouTube channel. If any of you want to find out more, get involved with our webinars. We have a whole heap of them coming up. Most importantly, here's my name, Nat at Exceptional Individuals. If any of you have questions that we didn't have time to answer today, or you'd like to uh, ask me later on, you are very welcome to reach out. So I hope you all found that useful. Yes, excellent. I didn't write that myself.